good to go. Hello, everyone. I am Tony Stern, the Senior Associate Dean for Gender Equity and Clinical Affairs at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and the Mount Sinai System Vice Chair of Quality, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Science. We are so very excited to have Dr. Marcy Bowers here with us today. Within the Office of Gender Equity, we have been working to bring Dr. Bowers here for quite some time because we know the importance of her voice to our amplifying equity discussions. We are grateful that the Institute of Health Equity Research is our co-sponsor for this event, because not only is Dr. Bowers paving the way forward for gender equity in the workforce every day, but her groundbreaking clinical work continues to ensure equity within her field. We had over 150 people register for today's event, and that speaks to the importance of her work and how eager our Mount Sinai community is to hear Dr. Bowers' perspective and to learn from her. Dr. Bowers is recognized as a pioneer in the field of gender affirming surgery. She is the first surgeon with transgender history and the first woman to perform gender affirming genital surgeries worldwide. She is a pelvic and gynecologic surgeon with more than 32 years experience. She is a University of Minnesota Medicine Medical School graduate where she was class and student body president. Following residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Washington, she practiced in Seattle at the Polyclinic and Swedish Medical Center. Dr. Bowers left Seattle in 2003 to apprentice with the legendary Dr. Stanley Viber, considered the father of transgender surgery. In 2010, Marcy relocated to San Francisco Bay Area community of Burlingham, California. She has now performed more than 2,250 primary gender affirming vaginoplasties and 3,900 gender affirming surgeries overall. In 2014, Dr. Bowers was hired to renew transgender surgery at Sheba Hospital in Tel Aviv, Israel. Subsequently, she initiated trans surgical education programs here at Mount Sinai in 2016, Denver Health in 2018, the University of Toronto Women's College Hospital in 2019, Northwell Health in 2020, and Children's Hospital Los Angeles in 2020. The Mount Sinai Transgender Surgical Fellowship is the first of its kind. Dr. Bowers performed the World Professional Association for Transgender Health's first two live surgery vaginoplasties at Mount Sinai in 2018 and 2019. Dr. Bowers is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health president-elect and currently serves on the Trevor Project Board of Directors, having served previous terms with GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, and the Transgender Law Center. Her gender diverse work has been highlighted by appearances on Oprah, CBS Sunday Morning, Discovery Health, and the TLC reality series, I Am Jazz. She was interviewed in 2021 by Leslie Stahl for the CBS News program, 60 Minutes, and Dr. Bowers is recognized as one of the 100 most influential LGBT people on the Guardian's World Pride Power List and one of Huffington Post's 50 transgender icons. She has been called the transgender surgery rock star, the Georgia O'Keeffe of genitalia, and the Beyonce of bottom surgery. I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Bowers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. And Danielle and uh, Dr. Mays and all the organizers. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here and see you all this morning. Uh, for me, it's morning. I guess for you, it's afternoon now. But um, but welcome everyone. And uh, I hope to add to the discussion here in in that uh, we were speaking this morning about how um, how it's important that we that we all share our uh, strengths in our own minority status and that if we can link somehow together, we, we aren't just minorities that are subject to oppression, but actually a force in and of ourselves. And uh, so that's what really this is all about is understanding the, the, the notion of intersectionality and how that can be um, not, not uh, points of difference, but actually points of commonality that allow that linking to occur. Uh, we're, we're getting there in this world, although it's a, we all know uh, in recent times and 
uh, with uh, the Russian invasion. And there's a long way to go. Uh, people, people don't understand each other. And, um, and uh, there's, there's just a, there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of angst still in, in this world. So I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the transgender process, just a few basic facts. So if you walk away with anything, maybe those will be things you recall. Uh, I'll talk about my career and how I ended up here and uh, all, all the things I've done. Sometimes I can't even remember the list myself, so I'm glad you read those things. <laughs> um, and then last, I'm going to write to you, uh, I'm going to read to you just a, a bit from the letter I wrote a couple days ago uh, to Bill Maher. And if you know the show real time, I was quoted on that. Um, my, my words of, of, uh, of concern about puberty blockers have been unfortunately taken and used in an, in an unhelpful way. Uh, rather than recognizing that this is what science does, you know, science, we make hypotheses, uh, we test those hypotheses, and then we make adjustments to those hypotheses based on fact and science. And that's what medicine and science does. But instead, in the political world, what people do as soon as there is a, as soon as there is any kind of dissent within the kitchen, uh, then uh, it's it's weaponized and used for political purposes. Uh, something that's really antithetical to any of us who are in medicine and science. So with that, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen here shortly, and here we go. So let's see if I can actually figure this out. Okay, or is that is that sharing now? It looks like it is. Yes. Great. And here goes the slideshow. So that is myself there operating at some point. And first of all, the point I'll make is just that there's a there's a a current description of the incidence of transgender persons in the U.S. Uh, I think the term now again, terminology continues to change. Uh, you know, use what you have, but, but just listen, because I do find that with each change in terminology, uh, it, it sharpens our definition. And so even in this point, I would say that probably I would change this now to say that TGNC, transgender nonconforming um, facts, rather than that. And, and also that, that this incidence is, uh, is, is, is rapidly changing. Um, it is, um, uh, the the numbers of each generation she, seem to be going up, but people that identify as not necessarily male or female. And uh, there are a few in our community right now who are questioning this, and they're saying the rise is too fast and that it's some sort of social contagion. And I think rather than rather than labeling it or questioning it or pushing it down, really what people should say is, why is that happening? And I think just what you're seeing is that you're seeing that young people are deciding that really what describes their gender identity, you know, what describes their internal sense of maleness and femaleness is not defined by only two choices. And really, if you look around nature, where else in nature are there only two choices except gender? There's just nothing else. And then if you can look at the, and if you can imagine, you know, the brain, if you can uh, appreciate this, the brain has so many inputs that, that can push a person into feeling one way or the other. Why would we use just one little part of anatomy to make this decision to put people in one of two boxes for the rest of their lives? It just doesn't make any sense. Can you imagine if people at birth were separated into smart people and dumb people? <laughs> or, uh, or tall people and short people. I don't know. It just it, it's all preposterous. And the idea that the brain, with all of its inputs from the environment, from hormones, from chromosomes, from medical conditions that can masculinize, masculinize or feminize the body, even why is it surprising that the brain would have different definitions for maleness and femaleness? And so, really, that's what transgender nonconforming. Um, inclusion is all about. People are saying, I don't really feel like I'm, you know, a quintessential 
male. I'm not Tom Brady and I'm not just Sal Bunchen, you know, I mean, I'm, I feel like maybe I'm a little bit in between. It also makes sense hormonally. Every adult male and every adult female has both estrogen and testosterone. So why wouldn't that have a contribution in how someone perceives themselves that maybe they might feel a little bit in the middle? So I'm just saying it's a biological explanation. Uh, second, the treatment, medical and surgical treatment for gender dysphoria, the medical term that's associated with, uh, that's, that describes those who seek to change their bodies, either with hormones and or surgery, is associated with improvements in self-esteem, confidence in psychosocial functioning. I mean, this ship has sailed. This is unquestioned. The, um, in fact, the, this, is, this comes from a Cornell University Center uh, meta-analysis of more than 4,000 studies on the subject over 40 years. And its director, Nathaniel Frank, actually said, quote, a consensus like this is rare in the social sciences, that you can get this kind of overwhelming result in a clinical trial. This is just, it works. And it's, that is, that is who it is. Uh, it is what it is. It, it works. A uh, third, uh, the, this is a question that always comes up is that, well, what if people change their mind? You know, well, first of all, you know, what if they do? Sometimes it's just part of their journey. Um, it doesn't happen very often though. People spend most of their lives trying to figure out how to stay in that box that they're assigned at at birth. And when they finally break free of the gender box that they're put in at birth, the one of two choices, they rarely ever, 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 ever want to go back in. And this is, doesn't matter what study you look at. Um, there are a few vocal people who claim that they were either fast-tracked or treated, treated too early or treated without insufficient evaluation, or they've had external influences like, you know, religious, um, there's the, the, the um, uh, practice of, um, what am I trying to say? Conversion therapy, where people are trying to, they're trying to, they're they're trying to convince them that they actually were the 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 they want to get them back in that box, basically. And uh, it just doesn't. It it really practically it really doesn't happen. And in fact, in the the study that's used uh, for some of the the negative commentary about transgender uh, uh, treatment. Uh, the same study, De Gene in uh, 2014 in Sweden, uh, I'm sorry, Amsterdam, uh, the, not only is the incidence low, like less than 1% where people regret any sort of uh, decision, but it's declining by decade. And then the controversial area where, what do we do with children who come out, who present as their uh, non-assigned gender prior to puberty, the opportunity was realized based on the use of precocious puberty um, treatment in the 1970s that we could use GNR, GNRH agonists or so-called blockers. These are, this is a, um, a hypothalamic hormone that, uh, that was introduced to treat precocious puberty, in other words, puberty that comes on too early in life. And so if you can delay that, then they, and then take away the blocker, then they can resume a normal puberty. And so it was decided that, or it was hypothesized that this would be a great treatment for, for uh, trans youth. Uh, so it is, it, the, to, I won't get into the controversies right now, but, um, but most certainly it's reversible. I mean, it's been used for 50 years. Uh, there is some concern about bone density, but that too is reversible and it's treatable. Uh, but, uh, but these things are, are things that, that people in the, the skeptics tend to, to bring up. Uh, but it is well established as an effective treatment. And so you can delay puberty until the aspects of permanency uh, become established. So time is always an ally in the treatment of, 
of TGNC people that if they do decide they're going to go on. So that's one thing is that uh, in this in avoiding this idea that you're someone's going to somehow change their mind, just give it more time. And you know, those things work out. But with puberty blockers, you get that time. You usually they're given two years to make that decision. Is this really right for me? So it it is it does work, and it and people rarely go back. So next to intersectionality, which I alluded to, uh, but to define this, it's really um, this is just a one of many definitions I've seen. But this is. It describes the ways in which oppressive institutions like racism, sexism, transphobia, um, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, they're all interconnected. And other principles of intersectionality that, you know, one, it implies diversity, uh, but it also describes personal experiences of transphobia or other isms and that, but also that these are not matches for other forms of oppression. So each one is individual, but it's also collective. So nothing about us without us, we're all together, we're linked. And if we can link arms, we're stronger and suddenly we become the majority, not the minority. And finally that, but really that also that many of the challenges within those intersectional issues, those can inform us and make us stronger so in my professional career, I've had certainly my share of challenges just going all the way back to childhood. And I'll just show you, this will be my little travelogue through my little life history here, <laughs> like it or not. Um, and, uh, but, but uh, you know, I went through some educational challenges, transitional challenges in my own uh, gender journey, uh, familial issues as a result of that, employment uh, uh, challenges, sexual emotion, et cetera. So I was born uh, a baby like everyone else and uh, a very happy baby, although I had a large hematoma on my head because I was a forceps baby. And, but I, you know, once that went away and I grew some hair, I was okay. <laughs> and I had a very loving mother who's still around. in fact, I, on my way to New York a month ago, I got to see her for her 85th birthday. Can hardly believe it. And I had a pretty normal childhood. I did all sorts of things, but of course I did it in, the, in my assigned gender or at least the best I could. I didn't really, I was uh, always the skinniest kid on the block, you might say. Um, and uh, you know, we grew up in the sixties, so we did groovy things like fondue parties. But as you can see from my picture on the right, I was really uncomfortable in my birth assignment, <laughs> you know, especially sitting next to a, you know, to a dad who was, you know, quite, quite my, quite, quite a bit unlike me. And so it grew into a fairly unhappy, well, I was happy, but it was a, you know, I was certainly a rebellious adolescent, like so many kids are. Um, but part of this was punctuated by the fact that I was bullied for a couple of years. And if anything you see in these, uh, the commonalities in these tragic school shootings is, you know, is that we, um, you know, we don't, we're, we're so quick to punish one another instead of, um, instead of involving and engaging one another. And I think we need that. That's really part of it. It add, it plays into the bullying process. It enables bullies. Um, when you, when you put someone down, it lets people pile on and, um, uh, the school shootings, it, have they have common threads and 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 bullying is one of those. Um, I was never inclined to violence. I tended to withdraw, but in it in it, but it did make me stronger. So that's the other thing is that if you can pull a person out of those situations, um, you can you can make them stronger. So indeed, I went on to medical school and was uh, was likable enough or leadership of enough, I guess, that they elected me class president somehow. And at the University of Washington, I was my chief resident and a few other honors that were, my, I got the teaching award as I went through my training there at the University of Washington in Seattle. You can see I moved my way Northwest as I grew up. <laughs> uh, but of course there were educational challenges along the way. I eventually, 
went into private practice at a clinic in Seattle called the Polyclinic, was there for 12 years. But I had uh, beneath that uh, many of my own, uh, my own simmerings, my own intersectional challenges and the fact that I felt really wrongly assigned that my, my, my external presentation didn't really match how I felt internally in terms of my gender identity. So although externally people would say I was kind of a swashbuckler, I guess they, they thought I was pretty cute. <laughs> the other way, um, I felt, I felt, and, you know, you go on and you'd play the game and you marry and you have children. And I did all of that uh, as best I could, but, you know, I was still this uh, other person. And so over the course of about uh, 12 months, this, I went from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. <laughs> And kind of did it, I did it while I was department chairperson of the largest OBGYN department in uh, the state of Washington. And so it was kind of surreal to walk into department meetings and have people see me and then they saw me as a woman and they just, it was, I was kind of playing two roles and I didn't know how to talk. And I, it was a, a then, you know, we'd have department heads kind of flirt with me because, you know, I don't know, it was just surreal. So. Um, I, I managed, and um, I, I it I took a lot of grief during those times. It was it was a, the late 1990s when people just didn't do this sort of thing, and you had to battle things like you know what do I wear every day, and this is a whole new you know whole new set of wardrobe, and I never got you know the the I never got to the the classes on hair care or or uh, <laughs> coordinating outfits and things like that. So. It, it was a challenge. Plus, I had to maintain my professional role. Uh, but there are also things like sex-specific customs and how people, you know, how you walk into an elevator and um, and uh, and uh, you know, having having uh, young male medical students stare at your breasts when you were at rounds, and you know, it was just a safety when I went out, building friendships and. But I think the main thing is just loving myself and believing in myself is what eventually uh, it was all about. And, and that, and that be, I began to emerge. I didn't see myself as an other or some parody of a woman. I really just saw myself as society saw me, which was as a woman. And uh, there are, there are um, uh, theorists out there, uh, JK Rowling being one of them that, you know, sort of think that, that that this is, you know, just men invading women's spaces. And, you know, I would argue really, it's just that it's just, it's how society sees you. And if society sees you one way, you know, you're not, you really don't have a choice. This is who I am and this is what I am and I'm not ashamed of it. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, along the way I, and then this gets into family challenges. You know, how is, how am I gonna maintain my family throughout all of this? And somehow we've maintained a kind of a, evolved into more of a sisterhood, but um, uh, it, you know, we, we remain in sort of this quasi modern family marriage with, uh, with three children who are succeeding and thriving. And um, we still have some kind of a cool relationship and we do things together and vacation and it, it's not so bad, it's just modern family. So over time, these are my kids. Now my daughter on the here on the on the uh, my right on this picture. She's now uh, she's now a senior marketing manager for a cosmetics company in New York City and lives in the West Village. And my other daughter Julia lives in North London with her boyfriend. And my my son Thomas lives with me. So we maintain this kind of just kind of cool family, and um, we just get better. Uh, identity challenges, sure. Believing in yourself, those are all part of it. And sexual challenges, then, you know, that's a whole nother game and, and how that uh, intersectional issue, uh, how do you deal with the, the opposite sex, same sex, you know, your own sexuality, um, figuring those things out. I eventually um, settled in with uh, a, a boyfriend who moved with me to Colorado with my son, and we started a little family there when I eventually left uh, uh, Seattle and uh, went to learn transgender surgery. At the time in Seattle, though, I was still delivering babies. In fact, uh, I continued that when I left and moved to Colorado. 
uh, eventually delivering more than 2,000 babies during the 20 years that I did that sort of thing. But as I transitioned, uh, people were, you know, they wanted to be supported, but in a really weird way. Um, at the time, uh, being trans uh, was considered a mental illness. And in fact, that probably kept the incidence of people wanting to do so at a low level because they really didn't consider themselves to be crazy. I don't think any of us did, um, but uh, people would hand me notes like, you do know that transsexuals have a much greater, higher rate of suicide, things like that. Uh, wouldn't you be happier if other people didn't know your past? In other words, did go away from here. Um, and then, you know, really absurd questions again, like what makes you think you're a woman? So eventually I met Dr. Stanley Biber, who was uh, at the time uh, practicing at, in his late seventies in this very unlikely location on the Santa Fe Trail in the Southwestern US in a town called Trinidad. And uh, although he unfortunately passed away shortly after I took over, um, I came there in 2003, I was able to share with him and, uh, and uh, get some of his absolute magnificence and his, uh, his muscles here as he was showing us that in the 1950s, he came within uh, a short amount of actually qualifying for the, I think it was the 1956 Olympics in Helsinki as a as a weightlifter <laughs> so uh, but he um he was uh, both a surgeon doing these transgender surgeries a general surgery though doing all kinds of surgery in a little town of 9000 people and also a cattle rancher uh, he had over 2000 head of cattle um that he uh, that he uh, uh would uh, bring to market every year in fact uh, his his death was as a result of a cattle drive to Nebraska. He contracted some sort of pneumonia on that trip and, um, and never responded to treatment. But at the time he was 82 years old. So a good life and a great mentor. So I eventually moved there when I realized that the, the pressures of, of the uh, challenges I had in Seattle as, a, as, an, uh, as what everyone knew was a, you know, a, they knew my past and it was it was just difficult to many people were great about getting past that and uh, but you know it, something about change is good and uh, and so um, realizing that on the transgender landscape there was only Dr. Biber and a couple of other surgeons in the entire United States doing these operations and so it really it occurred to me that this is this was kind of a this was kind of my fate and uh, so when I took my boyfriend, Zach, and my son, Thomas, to Colorado, um, the rest, I guess, is history. So I, got, I moved to this magical place in the uh, east of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Blood of Christ, I guess, is the interpretation in Spanish. And uh, at the time, thanks to Dr. Biber, having done more than something like 5,000 operations in total, uh, it had become known as the sex change capital of the world and uh, was even referenced in an episode of Jeopardy. So I moved to this very interesting little town um, and uh, it had lots of Victorian buildings because of course it was on the Santa Fe Trail and uh, it had its, its thriving history in the early uh, 20th century. Now though, I had to go from being an OBGYN to learning a very, what is basically a plastic surgical technique from a general surgeon in a town where I was literally uh, Dr. Quinn medicine woman. I was uh, geographically in about the same location that Dr. Quinn was practicing back in the 1800s. And here I was a hundred miles from any major medical center uh, and uh, the only surgeon in uh, the surrounding three counties. So it was uh, quite a responsibility to try to pull that off. But somehow I did. I got help from Dr. Pierre Broussard, who continues to practice in Montreal. Uh, patients, though, do follow an orderly process when they go through transition. And they are, uh, they at least currently are required to have psychological evaluation, although some of these things are likely to change because listening to the, the trans community we really have to be respectful of the fact that people are very, you know, they're very angry that why should this choice about their identity and this affirmation of their 
soul, why should it have to go through these uh, series of hoops that, that people ha have put in place that they don't do for any other sort of surgery, like psychological evaluation, as though they might be mentally ill, the connotation you know, that comes from that. Um, but certainly a period of time is worthwhile and you know, trying it out, you know, certainly on hormones, living as the, themselves. Uh, many find this again so controversial uh, as do they find the, the arbitrary age of eight, age 18. You know, why is it that they have to wait till 18, especially when they had a social transition uh, from the age of nine? That really just seems like a cruel and arbitrary um, uh, waiting period. So these are the surgeries. So please hide your eyes if you're um, squeamish in the least, but we go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right really not so bad. I mean, it's just anatomy, probably pretty easy for me to look at, but maybe other people not so much. But these are the, the one stage procedures that we began doing in 2003 and evolving to, uh, to as we went along. Um, and if you're not familiar with normal anatomy, you can see, uh, you know, the clitoris, obviously, clitoral hood, labia minora, labia majora, and so this is what my goal was always as a gynecologist was to say, you know, I want to come with something that's incredibly um, reproducible and representative of, of female, the female vulva. And that's what I do. So uh, my, my prowess at doing this and my artistic skills, which I think is, a, is at least 50% of the operation, uh, those, those became known and... Uh, and appreciated. And so this resulted in the initiation of many of the surgical programs that we've talked about in uh, Israel and New York and in uh, several other locations. Eventually, though, I did leave, uh, Cal uh, did leave Colorado. And I think that challenge of just being in a frontier, kind of a pariah uh, to, my, to my medical colleagues, where I really didn't have a lot of support um, in a in a part of the state that itself was quite liberal, but to, just to the north was Colorado Springs, where uh, focus on the family and family research council and, a, and the large number of evangelical churches there. Um, sometimes they they put they put a lot of, they cast a, a a very stern look down towards us practicing in that little uh, community. So it was uh, just a, a difficult time in, in some ways to, to practice there, uh, especially after Dr. Biber passed away, uh, who had had a very pacifying effect on the population, being that he had delivered their babies and set their fractures and such. And uh, whereas I was just uh, taking care of the women of the community, uh, I didn't have quite the, the, I didn't have quite the, I wasn't quite grandfathered in, you might say, uh, to the community. So San Francisco was an opportunity and uh, obviously easier for patients to access and a much, uh, much more significant uh, uh, medical community. And then along the way with all of that success behind me, I was approached in 2007 by Nadine Gary, who is the director of a non-governmental organization called Clitoraid. Um, not, um, Never been quite comfortable with the name, but it certainly has a wonderful, uh, wonderful mission, and that is to provide restorative surgery to women that have been genitally mutilated. And this is really a shocking practice. It was um, uh, unknown to the Western world until uh, Fran Hoskins in the 1970s wrote an article in the New York Times, I believe it was, uh, describing the fact that that. Um, that 200 million women worldwide, 3 million women a year, uh, all the way back to the ancient pharaohs of Egypt had been doing this ritual procedure where a pinch of skin, including the clitoral glands, is, uh, is amputated uh, in, a, in, a, in a cultural practice uh, known as FGM. Now we've softened that a little bit because you know who are we uh, in this country who we do male circumcision, although it's quite different but it's, um, you know, we're, we're just removing the foreskin, but here um, we're still, it's a matter of consent and here we are judging. So the, the term female genital cutting has become more popular. Again, staying ahead of the language and recognizing that 
to be uh, to be to communicate effectively with people around the world. I think we have to we cannot stand as white saviors or 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 Western saviors, I should say, and and preach to others about. We just have to have one global moral standard, which is to say that that individuals have autonomy and they have rights. And uh, they need they need proper informed consent before they have practices performed on them, uh, which for me now includes male circumcision and surgery for intersex children. Uh, they they need to have a say in that in that process. But anyway, um, FGM or FGMC uh, was kind of like a you know it's like a bat mitzvah or a kinsinera type of thing where they were it's a it's a passage into women's hood in some cultures but it was also obviously done to to suppress or repress uh, women's sexuality and the problem is is that it takes not only not only does it take that clitoral that that part of their body away but it also deprives them of any sexual feeling in in uh, sexual relationships and uh uh, and uh, and even makes it painful to have any sort of sex. Plus, it adds uh, an obstructive barrier when the uh, the type the the um, let's see if it's in here. Um, this just shows some of the perspective. I'll just I'll get into them. I thought about that in a second that I left. Uh, but it's you can see it's mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, many of these countries have incidences of as much as ninety-seven percent of the girls are cut. Now laws have been passed in, uh, in, uh, throughout much of Africa about this, but they really are ineffective and they're rarely prosecuted because, uh, because Africa is a, a, a continent of small villages where people practice independent, in, independently and there are economic incentives for the cutters to continue to cut. So it was slowly information is trickling into these small communities, but it's, it, it, is, it has been a very slow process. But um, to give hope to these women, um, Dr. Boldes, who was working on some of the obstetrical injuries uh, that he had seen in, while working in Burkina Faso in, 19, in the 1980s, he began to ask the question, not just of repairing the, the injuries, but also seeing these uh, cases of genital cutting of what about their sexual function? And of course, because he's French and French think about sex, uh, <laughs> while the rest of us may, may not give it enough consideration, uh, they not only did they, they mapped out the clitoris and found that it was 11 centimeters, much larger than we'd ever really imagined. And so much so, the clitoris in my talks, I anatomically, when you look at it, really the clitoris is exact, it has every part that a penis has. In fact, I, I would actually, now I refer to the penis as just a large clitoris. I mean, functionally, it's the same thing. So, uh, so this, uh, this left the opportunity and the realization that in FGM, less than 3% of the clitoris is actually cut in its worst case. But the problem is, is that that cut allows the clitoris to retract back under the skin. And so Dr. Foldis recognized that if you can release that skin, open it, divide the suspensory ligament, allowing it to come down, you can actually restore sensory function for the women. And it's not just sensory function, but it's that sense that they actually have their anatomy back, which is why women are, are, have, have flocked uh, both to Dr. Foldis and to myself over the years, and where there's a great demand now in Africa for us to go there and begin teaching. So Dr. Foldis practiced at the Louis XIV the hospital uh, west of Paris, where I went uh, on two occasions in the late 2000s. Um, and uh, I mentioned some of this, this was just a description of the technique. But again, the women began, first they began to come to Africa or to, to Colorado. Now these were Western women. Uh, there are as many as 500,000 in the US who have been affected by FGM. And they began to come one by one. Uh, to the point now we have about a two and a half year waiting list, uh, although we did do our first uh, clitoral restoration surgeries at Mount Sinai a couple of months ago and are hoping to expand on that, um, on that, um, uh, on that access for, for women so that I'm not just uh, one of a few people that do this around the world. 
So uh, if you've never seen FGM, uh, there are three types, the, according, four types according to the WHO. Uh, the, the ironically, the well, the four type four is really the mildest of the types because it's more symbolic about nicking and cutting. But the most severe type is type three, and this is where not only is the clitoris in the clitoral glands and labia removed, but the um, but the um, the the skin is sewn closed in what's called infibulation, where there's really barely anything else. Uh, you can't imagine a baby coming out or letting alone. Uh, sperm getting in, but somehow these women end up sometimes can end up pregnant. Uh, and uh, but obviously this is just a very devastating scar. But yet in this operation called clitoral restoration surgery, we can divide that clitoris, uh, divide that that infibulation. I'm sorry, um, create the labia minora back a bit, and then bring that the the clitoral body down so that it can be contacted sexually. And after um, several uh, weeks of uh, months of healing, uh, there's still a little bit of this fibrinous exudate here, but uh, you can see there's a nice representation. There's the, the clitoris back and um, uh, really quite amazing and quite gratifying to be able to offer this to someone. Uh, I've often likened uh, sexual sensation to that of other sensory senses that we all possess like sight and smell and sound. And I feel like if we were to elevate the sense of sexual function and sexual sensation to this, um, and then offered a procedure, let's say that you could bring back eye eyesight to a blind man, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you do it? And wouldn't you recommend it? So we're slowly getting, uh, we're slowly getting uh, convincing the world that what we're doing is the right thing, that this, is, this does give women hope, um, but certainly women recognize that and they're very appreciative of what we're able to do. But the majority of that 200 million women are not in, uh, are not in um, the US they're actually, or Canada, they're, they're, they're in Africa. And so eventually the, the idea was to go to Africa and to build a hospital. We actually built this hospital. I contributed heavily to it, um, but it didn't open for some very strange political reasons. And uh, it's a whole circus and I can't get into that now, but it's a fascinating thing. If you ever get a chance, there's a, a BBC World uh, BBC uh, report about it and, and uh, uh, widely followed um, story there when we, um, we were the first team ever to go to Africa to do this kind of thing. Uh, we did succeed in Burkina Faso, but we ended up uh, actually in, um, in Nairobi. Uh, of course, a whole nother uh, intersectional challenge and that being, um, being you know, coming from a wealthy nation, coming to an area, we went to the poorest parts of Nairobi to do these surgeries and working in conditions that were really, really difficult. But we had a great man and mentor, Dr. Um, Abdullahi Aden, and uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he's a plastic surgeon and had the smart intuition to invite more than half of Kenya's plastic surgeons while we were there. And then with my other two angels, uh, Miranda Han and Angie Dean, uh, and Miranda's in Australia, Angie's in um, Canada, uh, we were able to, um, to do, uh, to, to rapidly, uh, to, to really increase our capacity there and to teach local doctors locally. And that was the important thing. So my typical day is usually lined with several groups and rows of doctors behind me. Um, patients just have flocked to Africa. It was just unstopped. It was just, uh, it, was a, it was a mob scene when we first went. And uh, so the, we have to keep the numbers down in order just not to be overwhelmed by, um, by interest in this. But certainly these, op these, these surgeries do work. Um, many of them are able, in fact, more than 80% are report their, yeah, they have improved sexual lives and more than half are able to orgasm, which for uh, a population that does very little sex education and are actually have, they're very repressed about their, um, about their um, attitudes towards sexuality. This is really quite, a, quite an accomplishment. So uh, yes, 2,000 babies, 2,200, 2,300 vaginoplasties, clitorises, you know, but living on the right side of history and recognizing the value of diversity, I guess that is probably the thing that really, really drives me and it continues to drive me. And then I just try to find a little bit of beauty in everything I do. Um, that's, uh, 
And that's where we go. And then just this nice little word from one of our uh, lovely patients. And she said, uh, Dr. Bowers, she said, this is Fatima. Uh, this surgery changed my life. It's been seven, seven months. Uh, I'm having the best O's of my life by myself. Sorry, TMI. <laughs> but the surgery is life-changing. And I wish every woman and girl like me can have it. I wish there was something I could do to support the life-giving and life-saving work that you're doing for us. Sisters, I have so much love and appreciation for you. So um, I, I'll just conclude by saying, um, sometimes, you know, uh, scientific method has, a, has an importance and it's, it's great to have a fact behind what you do, but sometimes the courageous ones, and anytime there is an advance in medicine, you, it's people that, that understand the problem and, and they devise a solution and as I say, you know, you don't need science to tell you you're doing the right thing. You need science to tell the world you're doing the right thing. So the research will follow and they'll show that what we've been doing all this time has been the right thing. So thank you. I hope that adds some inspiration to what all of you are doing and are going to do. Um, it's a, you know, Mount Sinai is my, that's my, that's my family there. It's my, it's my life. It's my love. And, um, I'm just, I'm just grateful for all of your, for your journeys and for allowing you to, for allowing you to, to listen to mine. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowers. This was incredible. Um, we did get some questions in in advance when people pre-registered, but we're also going to open up the floor for questions. And I see that Sky has their hand open. So Sky, I'll turn it over to you to kick us off. Hello. Hi, Dr. Bowers. It's such an honor to meet you. Um, my heart is like beating out of my chest right now. I'm so nervous. So excuse me. Um, my name is Sky. I'm a trans woman also, and, uh, actually an incoming MD PhD student at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was wondering why do you think surgical interventions for trans people took so long to re-enter academic medicine? And are you optimistic about, um, I guess, yeah, like the future of surgical care for trans patients, especially as more people are being trained in trans surgery and as academic medicine is um, starting to catch on. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, well, uh, the, 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 it's, it's interesting that you bring up academics because it, uh, for the longest time, there was no trans care available anywhere in academic institutions. But if you go back to the 1960s, uh, when we were, before we had junk science and where medicine was politicized, uh, there were institutions across the US that you could get, you could get gender affirming care or sex changes as they used to call them in lots of locations, Chattanooga, Tennessee, raw, uh, 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 North let's see, Raleigh and uh, Norfolk, Virginia had a program. Galveston had a program, UCLA, University of Minnesota, University of Washington. They were just, they were all over the country. And, but I, I think that what happened is that uh, Johns Hopkins opened a, uh, a treatment program in 1966 and they saw thousands of patients, but you know, they only operated on 27 patients ever got their their surgery through Johns Hopkins. And then they hired an, an individual, um, Paul McHugh, who's still somehow alive today. And his name is still attached to the, the idea that, uh, that what are we doing? We're treating a psychological illness with medicine and surgery. Why are we treating these crazy people? And that, that, um, that theme caught on. And then they designed a paper that was supposedly uh, there to uh, show that people were no happier after surgery than they were before. And so this is why Johns Hopkins then, uh, which was looked to as this thoughtful, you know, beacon on the hill uh, as being the, when they, they published that paper and then closed their program as a result in 1979, that's what led to the rise of Dr. Biber and the privatization of 
of transgender surgeries up until just this last decade. It's incredible. And I knew it was going to change when I was invited. Actually, the first two places, the first two universities that invited me to speak was, it wasn't Mount Sinai or UCLA or somewhere like that. It was actually the University of, of Utah and the University of Kentucky. And so I, I knew then that it was going to change in a, in a good direction. Um, it is getting better. Um, I, with more people comes more thinking and more minds. Um, I'm a little worried right now because the, the, not everyone does the quality of the care that I think that we give. And that's a little scary. And I see in some ways worse results than I ever have seen uh, from other surgeons uh, because people are getting into it sometimes for the wrong reason. And it takes a real unique combination of passion and artistry in order to do these surgeries and do them really, really well. So, um, but, you know, it, time always takes care of things. And that's why you have to trust medicine and, and well-meaning clinicians and scientists to do the right thing, which is why it's so upsetting to see anti-trans bills coming for treatment of trans kids that that's really that's just meant those are people that are jumping on the bandwagon and using it to hijack their own social agenda that's all that's happening there that's just pure meanness and uh, opportunism on the part of legislators but when do we want legislators making medical decisions good lord do you want judges and lawyers treating your cancer or your or your diabetes i mean i don't think so on that note, Dr. Yeah. Bowers, we had a question from one of the registrants um, early on, and you touched on this in your presentation when you talked about seeing the beauty in every day and also just remembering why you do what you do. But how do you deal with backlash from folks that don't understand your role in helping people? Um, it's really easy to deal with it, actually, because I know that I'm standing on the right side of history. And when you speak truth, it's very, very difficult to, you don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to be afraid. You just have to speak truth. And I know, I mean, I know that, that diversity makes the world brighter in every, every possible realm. This is what mounts, this is what we're about. This is what this country is about. It's about embracing diversity. We haven't completely gotten along with one another. There's still racism. There's still shootings. There's still frustration. We don't know how to, there's so many problems that we have, but you know, we're a collection of, every, of everyone in the world in this country. And, um, and it's that diversity that still makes us strongest. Absolutely. I hope you can see some of what's happening in the chat. You're getting a lot of thank yous. Um, from folks and, and just a lot of people who are thrilled to have been able to hear you. We do have a question that came in from Natasha. Um, beautiful talk. What an incredibly amazing journey. What are your thoughts and scientific guidelines about educating trans women about the risk of prostate cancer development, especially after being on estrogen or hormone feminizing treatment? I mean, estrogens for assign male individuals with, so those persons with prostates, uh, it atrophies the prostate. So uh, for even prostatic, yeah, actually it used to be used in advanced prostate cancer to shrink prostate cancer. So stage four uh, estrogens were used that is. Uh, so it's a, it, it, in causing cancer, it doesn't cause, it just doesn't cause prostate cancer. I'll just, flat out say that I, you know, it'll be, it's a very rare finding uh, as it is. And if it was there, it's usually because it was there a priori or it was there before the, the start of hormones, I would say. It doesn't cause prostate cancer. And if you could share, this is another question that we got before the talk, but if you can share your thoughts on improving recruitment for LGBTQ folks into clinical trials. Uh, yeah, um, so this would be, this would be for uh, trans care or LGBT care, or is it just in getting- They didn't people? specify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think um, 
I mean, I think where there are studies in, you know, I mean, use your voice and, and step in if you're, if you're so inclined. I mean, obviously you keep yourself safe and, and confidential and you do what's right for you. But if it's, if people want to know answers, you know, be, give those, but give them objectively. Don't, don't try to, don't try to skew the results. You know, I think sometimes people try to give the investigators what they want to hear instead of what they, we just, we all, we just need to maintain objectivity. This is the whole beauty of science and medicine is that we stay objective. You know, just like I, when I came out and I had concerns about, about initiating hormone blockers for children because it affected their, their um, surgical results at maybe, and, and, and it might affect how they respond sexually. You know, that got, I got a lot of, I got backlash on the, the left also uh, for people who felt like I was abandoning the cause and that that was, how can you bring up anything that could be remotely negative? And it's not that, it's just that we needed to, we needed a, an adjustment. We needed a change of, slight change of course. And it's really stimulated good debate in our scientific community. But again, unfortunately it's been hijacked by, by people who have their own political agendas. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Joy, I see that you have your hand up, so I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you. And thank you for your informative talk. I, my name is Joy Reidenberg. I'm faculty here at Sinai. I have two questions for you, but I guess I have to pick one. So I'll pick one. Having lived as both a man and as a woman, what can you tell us about the differences and how the world treats you, not as a trans woman, but as a woman? Well, that's, this is the thing is that people don't, you know, I, I mean, again, I, I share this, just, I'm out and, you know, to all of you, which is sort of embarrassing because I don't really see myself that other way anymore and nor does the world. And I, I live in the world as a woman and without any qualifications, um, you know, it's, it's just, this is me. So I, I do have a unique, it's like polarized sunglasses. You know, I really have had a, a unique way to, to look at and, and to see how, um, how we're all treated differently. And there are good and bad, obviously, in, in what I do. Uh, I will say that, uh, believe it or not, professionally, sometimes my, you know, it, people won't, it, even on committees, like, you know, within GLAD or within organizations, you know, you, you sometimes don't, uh, as a woman, you have to, you don't get the recognition that you do uh, compared to when a man speaks. <laughs> Just, I cannot deny it. And, um, and I was, at first I was thinking, well, that's because it's the trans, but it's not the trans, it's because I'm a woman. And, and that's, women have to be smarter, sharper, clearer, um, more intelligent and, you know, that's all I can do. I, you know, I, <laughs> um, the, the good side and, and, a tr and it's also true. You can use it to your advantage though. I mean, I think that's the one thing is that, you know, when we went, I took my daughter one time, um, to a, a vegetable market and the, the owner of the market used to always kind of flirt with me. And you know, men are really kind of simple creatures. <laughs> I hope there's not too many men out there that take offense, but um, you know, they, I think they all operate under the premise that if there is a one in one zillionth chance that they could possibly have sex with you, they'll do anything for you. <laughs> and um, so we used to go and, and he, would, he would take and, and um, shopping with my daughter, he would, he would, you know, we'd buy cherries and he'd give us an extra half pound of cherries or, you know, he'd give us a little something extra every time. And I, and, and uh, my daughter said, oh, he's so nice. And I said, no, honey. I said, that's just known as the pretty girl discount. So you just get a little, so sometimes those are the good things. Uh, also, there's um, one thing that I, I like, there's a, there's a sisterhood that's out there. I'll tell you another story. It was um, that you just don't, you don't get as a, you don't get as a man. Um, men are just kind of, you know, they'll bump you out of the way just to get, you know, I had, you know, you're not going to get any you know, there's no real, bro there's kind of a brotherhood, but it's kind of like a, uh, uh, you know, kind of rough macho brotherhood. But I was traveling, I was connecting through Chicago and I actually had bought a little personal pizza and I had my hands full. I had my luggage and, you know, all the stuff you do and you're, 
and I had to use the restroom and I had this darn pizza box. I'm like, what am I gonna do with it? And so this woman said, um, can I hold that for you while you go? And I was like, well, you know, there never would a man do that. Never would a man hold a pizza box for you while you peed. There's no way. So women, there's lots of things like that. Women look after one another in a sisterhood kind of way that's really kind of special. So, you know, it's uh, lots of examples of sexism and things that sort of are frustrating, but there's, there's also some good too. And I, you know, I personally would never, never trade places with a man. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and spending uh, this past hour with us. And Dr. Bowers, thank you so much for letting us all into your journey, your world, all the great and amazing work that you do. I, I, I can speak for a lot of the people in the chat who are just blown away by how wonderful it was to hear from such a trailblazer. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks Everybody a lot. Have a great yeah, day. So I tell my story. <laughs> okay. Yay. Thank you all for being here. Okay, are we are we picking up then? Um, are we doing a little debrief? Is that what's happening after this? Or? We have a debrief in. Let me stop the recording. Hold on. I want.